It's time to welcome on stage our guest from the fantastic series Red Dwarf, we all know and love. We have, first of all, she played the female Pride, so we've got a male and the female Pride on the stage today. How cool is that? We can have a bigger woo than that. So ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Judy Pascoe! Please give it up for the fantastic Mr. Chris Berry! Um, see if you can guess where I'm headed. <laughs> so I'm going to pass the microphone and let's see if Mr. Flibble will be asking the question. Uh,
I think just the fun we all had doing it really, it was, that's the main thing and the fact that it continues through generations now is, is just fantastic. So, and like Chris, once you've done Red Dwarf, you compare the next thing to Red Dwarf, you think, oh it's not as good, I won't do that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, it was just brilliant and it was just fun, it continues to be fun, just seeing everyone the whole time, it's, it's just great. I won't make happy family, you know. <laughs> I think my favourite was the last series that you guys did, what was that, number 10? 10. Um, because they were all just so old and fat. That <laughs> they just didn't give a shit anymore and they were so much funnier because of it. <laughs> Huge, great, tumbling mass of empathy. <laughs> no, you were. You were all much funnier in the last series, I thought. It was great seeing them backstage with all their, everything hanging out and they just had their costumes on, apart from Danny. Danny, I know. Danny still got a six pack. Yeah. <laughs> Danny wore costumes in series 10 that he wore in the first series. <laughs> they still fit. Guess how much Chris and I hate Dan. <laughs> What was your favourite episode of Red Wolf? It's very difficult one to answer, isn't it? I mean, I, don't, I, I, I haven't got a favourite. Uh, certainly one that stays in my mind, simply because it was done quite recently, was... Um, <laughs> I to forget what it, which one it was. Um, Lemons from series 10, uh, when we went back in time and met, uh, met Jesus. Um, <laughs> and his twin brother, Judas. Uh, I thought that was just a brilliant script, a brilliant idea. The, the, the set smelt beautiful, which is very unusual on Red Dwarf. It usually smells of freshly drying paint and Craig. And um, <laughs> at that time it smelt of lovely spices and herbs and fresh baked bread in the markets uh, square. It was a beautiful smell, wasn't it? it sometimes it's easier to pick uh, a Red Dwarf episode that is your least favourite, because, I mean, there's, again, there's such a sort of good... Uh, Doug, you know, Rob and Doug were very good at editing out any scripts that weren't going to go anywhere. Um, but yeah, favourite scripts, I, I would, I always, you know, go to Dimension Jump with the first appearance of Ace. Yeah, um, that's true. And those were some of my, uh, you know, favourite scenes, doing sort of uh, Ace along, you know, uh, with um, the person I affectionately call a snakehead, remember? <laughs> um, but you know, then I caught a glimpse of uh, Polymorph the other day and the, the scene, the campaign for the liberation and integration. Yes. <laughs> it was a scene that, for many reasons, I will not forget. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, there's so much good stuff. Marooned, you know, where we got rid of the B team. Um, and Craig and I, <laughs> Craig and I had a nice two-hander. Um, you know, what was it, something okay. Alexander's favourite eunuch. Or something. It's so many nice speeches. Isn't it? Chief eunuch. Wasn't Chief eunuch. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Always a lie on a reminder. There's people here who probably know the scripts better than we did. We ever did. Yeah, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I would say amongst you know the, those certainly those two, Dimension Jump and, and um, Marooned. Gunman of the Apocalypse. That was yeah. award winning, wasn't it? Award winning. Cool. The award winning oh. Gunman of the Apocalypse, Chris. Yes, but I was shit scared because I don't ride horses. <laughs> that, that, was a great, that was a great line. There's no steering wheel or handbrake. I remember as <laughs> his pony charged off into the mist. I thought British motorcycles were unreliable. <laughs> Those horse things are also smellier. And, um, yeah, where's the clutch? Um, and of course, you know, it was it Danny who helpfully, towards the end of the day, you know, we're all standing in a row, went, yee-haw! And of course, the horses took off. <laughs> Stop! Stop! <laughs> and unfortunately, the, um, the horse wrangler managed to, um, managed to stop us riding out of a motorway, which was. <laughs> yeah. Hattie? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking Dimension Jump and, uh, <laughs> and Polymorph, the, the same thing, and, and I enjoyed watching Meltdown, that one amused me, because I didn't go on location very much. A couple of times on location was watching. Uh, uh, Ace Rimmer and Lister trying to mend the spaceship. That was one of my favourite watching on location things. Oh, with the uh, stool. Yeah, the stool, because they did it in December and uh, they were out on the, outside the spaceship with a big fan going around to make it a typhoon and everything. And the uh, side, uh, special effects blokes 
delighted in getting buckets of cold water to chuck at them. They could have warmed it up, but they uh, deliberately made it freezing cold, didn't they? I think both Craig and I nearly drowned that night. Yeah. <laughs> and Doug was going, yeah, but it looks great. Yeah. It's sort of the It's the most important thing. And every time they went to say something, they, they just threw it whenever you were about to say something. That's what I mean, yeah. yeah. Just got a mouth of cold water. Oh, listen. Yeah. <laughs> A meltdown because these were look-alike people who usually owned supermarkets and were just sent flying across a field of explosives. That amused me. <laughs> and Judy, what about your favourite? Well, I guess I guess I have to say Camille. This was in, <laughs> I was in. But it was very funny. Someone uh, came up to us before and did a whole section of the dialogue. I don't know if they're here now. They could redo that <laughs> massive section of the dialogue. I don't remember any of it, but they knew the whole the whole thing. It was a great story though because we met each of them met their ideal partner, wasn't it? So um, Chris met his ideal partner, then Robert met the female Crichton, and then Lister, and then Danny met himself. <laughs> One of the weird things was my mother in her kitchen. Uh, she's passed away now, but a few years ago, she had pictures of my my brother and his wife and children on the kitchen wall, and my daughter, my sister and her children, and then in the middle there was a picture of Crichton and Camille. <laughs> it was so bizarre. When her, when her ladies came round to play bridge, she said, oh, that's my son and his girlfriend. <laughs> I was about to say, if you had met on, on, on the episode, then um, stop whinging, you egging bastard. It would have shown a lot of familiarity for a few years ago, just a short and time. A, and a brilliant chat-up line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great <laughs> In turn for, for all of you, which scene or line during the whole of the, all the seasons do you remember is taking longest to film because I, either cast or crew kept laughing? Oh, it did happen. The attachment, I would say. The attachment, yeah. <laughs> Brighton's growing on attachment was always fairly stressful to work with. <laughs> it had a mind of its own. <laughs> Um, I mean, I certainly remember in one of the seasons, series eight, when um, Crichton uh, wished Kachansky a happy period. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd done, I mean, I think we'd laughed a lot when we read that, but when, when, and we were in a set that was, in, in, we were in front of an audience, but we couldn't see the audience. This was a specific set that was built at the back. So, uh, you know, we, we, and so we'd rehearsed that line, and when I, when I delivered the line, you know, happy period, Mom, and held up over that. <laughs> We had to wait for so long for the next line just because the laugh, but we could, it was sort of distant, it was sort of over there, and it was really, really confusing. Well, that, was a, that was a bizarre moment. You'll have some much better ones than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, no. <laughs> well, I think of the one that does spring to mind is, is the aforementioned, yeah. you, you'll bonk anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The shrinking. Well, obviously that wasn't because we're laughing. That was because the audience were, were laughing, and you had to sort of ride the line, uh, ride the laugh. Um, and I've always said to, in this situation, Q and A's. That was my next line. But I saw it the other day when I said I, I saw uh, Polymorph the other day, and that's not my next line. Uh, you're bonking. There's something else I put in before. Right. That. Does anyone? Do you, does anyone know? Um, I'm totally surprised. <laughs> no, that's why you failed us miserably. <laughs> <laughs> You don't, you know, still there. I can't say I'm entirely surprised. I can't, oh, say, I'm surprised. I can't, I can't say I'm entirely surprised. That was it. You're right, that's hey. it. That's the line. And we didn't have to wait an eternity to sort of ride the, the, the audience laugh uh, oh, to come really in behind that. getting Red Dwarf on the screen. A real ball of energy, the dynamic sort of producer of the old school, wonderful guy. Um, but he did put the fear of God into you if you forgot your lines. So. Sometimes I remember in the early series, Red Dwarf would be standing there thinking, uh, you don't want to get the lines wrong, you don't want to start coursing, because Paul is going to go nuts. And of course, as soon as someone says that, you start for some reason coursing. And just Paul's look, face of thunder, it was, you know, just go around, and he'd, just, just, he'd lower the head, and you'd say, now is not the time to corpse. Yeah. So, so, those, so when you say coursing, that's what I'm kind of reminded of, you know, but we, um, we, 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 we corpsed all the way through lots of stuff. Anyway, that's, so that's a really dull answer, but anyway. You always used to make faces at each other, you used to make each other cross. With me sitting there as Holly staring yeah. at you lot. Well, making faces at each other just makes us annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question from a gentleman in the middle. Um, 
if you sort of looked at the characters on the screen, would you say that the attributes and sort of uh, little quirks of the characters that you play relate to yourselves in any way at all? Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> totally yes. <laughs> I think there is there are s slight elements that I feel the, the, the certainly in the first sort of six, seven series that the writers would observe things about us and kind of gently introduce notions of them uh, into the into, into our characters. So there is something of us. Uh, there's definitely something of us, but I mean, you know. Not, not quite to the extreme that it's shown on the screen, but... Uh, I mean, I, I say definitely not, but uh, I remember in around series five or something, that Robin Duck had a habit of sort of putting lines that we'd say in rehearsal <laughs> in, into the script. Work it in, yeah. I mean, we remember in, the, in, in Starbuck um, said we, we'd had a bit of a sort of, you know, sort of fairly testy kind of time rehearsing some of the scenes. Yes. And um, I, I think I must have you know, this is not Rimmer, this is me, walking around, stomping around, saying, for God's sake, why can't we just be more professional? <laughs> uh, I mean, a, 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 as a group. Um, and then suddenly, I get the script, <laughs> a day later, and Rimmer sort of says, can't we just be more professional? <laughs> so, uh, there was something else that went in, you know, that someone else had said. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think Rimmer is a classic, anally retentive oik um, <laughs> of the traditional British kind. And I'd be lying if I said that I, you know, uh, wasn't, you know, there weren't traits of me that could develop that way. Um, but, you know, if you're like that permanently, I, I wouldn't survive, I don't think. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I think he's, he's a classic old-fashioned British loser. When we were doing series 10, quite often after a long day in the, in the studio, he and I would go out for a curry. And I'd have a sort of gentle, middle-class, you know, chicken korma. With a, with a nan bread, you know, be terribly sort of, and Craig would have, they would make him a special vindaloo, lamb vindaloo thing, with sauce, and the, the Indian restaurant knew that they, that what he liked, so they have a little dish of sauce. I put my finger in it, and it burnt my finger, <laughs> by temperature, by just the sheer amount of spice, condensed spice, and he ate it, he just poured it, oh, a bit of sauce, just to pep it off. <laughs> so, yeah, there are elements. Yeah. And Danny has more clothes than any human being would ever, ever need. Always looks cool, doesn't he? I know, so annoying. <laughs> Can we have a question at the back? Hi there. Um, question for Chris. The Rimmer um, salute, how did that actually come into being? What was the methodology behind it? Um several days of me doing all sorts of idiotic salutes <laughs> and Doug going, um, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that's not bad, yeah, I mean, I mean, what, anything else? <laughs> so eventually we, we got to the, the notion of, of, of Rimmer doing a variation uh, of, I mean, what is normal, a straight salute, so the longest way up to so the shortest way down sort of thing, um, I think that's probably army. Of British Army circa the 70s, from what I can remember. Um, but you know, there had to be something in the middle, so we kind of left the middle to be, you know, whatever it might be, you know. And Rimmer thought he was doing that bit better than any other member of the Space Corps by doing that. But of course, Hollister would look at him and go, Rimmer, away. what's wrong with you? Kind of thing. You know? um, so, and then when he did the one that took forever, he thinks the longer he does it, that's Rimmer's logic, the longer I do it, the more elaborate it is, the more you'll like me. <laughs> but of course, that's nonsense. The longer and more elaborate it is, the more he thinks you're a prat. <laughs> so that's kind of the, the thinking behind it. We have a question here from a link from parts of my day. Hi, uh, a question for all of you. Would you be willing to sing or hum the Red Dwarf theme tune? <laughs> Hum option. <laughs> Do you know all the words? No, it's no. cold outside, there's no kind of atmosphere, I'm all, all alone, more or less. Oh. Is she singing or are you just saying? Well, I'm just going to the words before I sing it, I have to yeah. know the words. Come on, I got, I got. If we start after this, we can start. 
two, three. <laughs> Uh, 
the, 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 the rest of the, the, like the camera crew, the sound crew, everybody, the, the set designers, the costumes, they all say this is the hardest show they make. And, and uh, so it is, I think, I would think someone like Howard, who does the costumes, it, it gets more strange requests than we do, I think. Probably. Yeah, I, I mean, as Robert said, we're looking at a pretty strange show compared to something like, I don't know, Coronation Street or, you know, <laughs> anyway, you say that for so, <laughs> so, so in series eight was it when um, when Doug said, "Yeah, I think you, uh, Craig, and Chris have got to be naked for this." You know, it seemed to us that's, that was going to happen at some point. You know, <laughs> this is Red Wolf, you know. Um, so there's nothing you know really strange. You sort of, you know, Lister, hmm? kissing Lister. Yeah, that's strange. It's strange. <laughs> <laughs> Two men. In space, you know, we, we'd had the, you know, the industrial quantities of polo mints. Um, so it just tasted like one big soggy polo mint without a hole. <laughs> More of a sort of Murray mint or a, you know, those chewy mints, you know. Um, but it didn't go on for a long time. It was only, you know, it didn't show that much. Yeah, no, you were kissing for about half an hour. <laughs> All the best things in life go too quickly. <laughs> so yeah, no, um, I can't think of anything strange. I'll think of 30 things that are strange when I get out there, but that's the... Uh, yeah. I'll try, if anyone's not seen us at the table, I'll try and think of something even stranger than kissing great or being naked <laughs> for half the day. Um, with cameras being pointed at Marooned where you, you had to cope with the snowflakes going yeah. into your eyes. Uh, has there been any other memorable, difficult moments uh, in the filming of Red Dwarf that you've found difficult to cope with? Be careful how you answer because he's making a movie then. Yeah. <laughs> it's all been wonderful. <laughs> uh, I mean, those two, uh, particularly the, the, the snowstorm pulling Danny on the sledge, mush, mush, um, was the first, my first day's filming on Red Dwarf. So I'd never done anything like it before. I had my eyes glued open. Uh, with the makeup, the first day we put full makeup on and they, and they put too much makeup around my eyes, which meant my eyes were literally stuck open and I couldn't blink. And then I had to walk towards a massive fan that was blowing a hurricane at me while they poured soap flakes to look like snow into it. So you have your eyes glued open and you have soap flakes blown into your eyes. The result of that is some discomfort. <laughs> That's to say. And that was day one and I went, what have I done? And that was Paul Jackson, as uh, who, who Chris was mentioning just now. Uh, I think it was on the first or second day he's filming, he came up to me and gave me a, he's very physical, he, 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 close contact is very important to Paul, gave me a hug after we'd filmed, he said, I've read your contract, there's no get out clause. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't, I mean, other than that, I can't, I mean, those were very, uh, since then it's got a bit easier to cope with, and I've sort of learned how to deal with it a bit more, so now it's just a great big jolly romp. And we have another question in front. Hi, uh, this is mainly from Robert. Uh, if Red Dwarf took part in Scrap Heat Challenge, <laughs> what would they build? Oh, wouldn't it be great? I mean, it was a dream of mine always. I wanted two teams, one with Chris on one team, both highly efficient super mechanics who all work at McLarens and Williams and Jaguar, and then with Craig, some people who know how to drive a transit van through the front of a jewellery shop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it would have been such fun to do, and I was desperately always sort of pitching to do that. Can't we do that? You know, but, and uh, it never happened, which is a great shame. But um, I don't know what they could make. I mean, ram raiding would be one thing, uh, ram raid, which because I did always want to do a ram raid episode of Scrap Heap, and they, there was lots of discussions, and then lawyers got involved. And it was sure, I, th I think Craig and the team would probably win. I think they might. <laughs> Because they'd be single focus on building something like a transit with a railway sleeper on the front. <laughs> and do the same job as what they want. Whereas all the you know highfalutin yeah. mechanics would be all want to do different things. So we'd be yeah. still sitting around the table drawing silly yeah. pictures while they've already built some sort of <laughs> perfect round rate. Interesting, yeah. No, um, yes, I wish. <laughs> question here from a gentleman. Uh, first off, sorry I failed you on the second thing, <laughs> and it's a good double question. You've all done different programmes rather than Red Dwarf. If, what would you do? Any other programmes such as engineering or <coughs> comedy? And would we see another Red Dwarf series anytime soon? <laughs> <laughs> Guarded, yes. <laughs> 
understand the yes. I mean, yes, uh, you know, I've had other uh, offers to do some of the engineering documentaries that I did uh, since Britain's Greatest Machines and Massives and all that. Um, but, you know, we're living in times of, of, of sort of contracting budgets. And the first thing to go is usually the presenter, you know, which, which obviously makes a very different program and, you know, I would have to say I don't think quite as effective uh, a program. Uh, but yeah, if, if, if I'm offered the right vehicle, I'll, I'll, so to speak, I will do it. Um, second part of the question, Red Dwarf. I would say that there is something out there um, <laughs> that may happen. Uh, in the next uh, 24 months, um, make that 36. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, it is a bit topsy turvy at the moment, and, and obviously things will unfold over the next 12 months, certainly, and uh, things may become a little bit clearer. But I mean, it's um, uh, yeah, I think the will is there to certainly do more red dwarf, isn't that right? I think it is very true that uh, we're not sure yet whether it's a wibbly wobbly thing or a swirly whirly thing, but it's definitely looming. It's definitely approaching at speed. Uh, it's definitely not a black hole. It's not a black hole. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Um, it's a bit of a two-part question. First off, of all the inventions on Red Dwarf, like Look Virus and Tempest, which were your favourites? And this is for Chris and Robert. How long did it take you to learn how to pronounce Rixalabidium, Rixidixidoxidexidroxide? <laughs> well, I've never done it as good as that. And spell it. It was very cruel, really, that word. It? It was, yes. I mean, because you had to do it first. We all had to do it, which was really unfair. In the original script, I think it was only you said it. And then there was some, re there was some, you could just see them going, sitting in the, the writing room together, going, no, let's get Bobby to say it. <laughs> Type that in, and it was just brutal, just ridiculous. Because you, you had to kind of say it like it was just normal and like, everybody knows what that is. I mean, it's a slight cop-out and defeatism to say to, you know, Doug, um, is there any way we can get around not saying this? <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, so, uh, and Doug's just saying, think how funny it's going to be if you can do it. <laughs> Which is no help. But, um, but, he's, but he's right, you know. Um, and directors do that. They, they sort of, uh, on those engineering programs, you know, when you're, you know, you could get on one of these sort of power boats in Norfolk with the sun coming into your eyes with a helmet that doesn't fit, you know, with only one steering thing and an engine you can't stop. You know, I'm thinking, I don't want to do this because um, I might die. <laughs> and the director's going, but God, it's going to look great if you can. <laughs> and that's what we have to put up with. <laughs> but it will go a long way from, from that word. Um, I can't say it now to answer your question. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, it was, we did on the day, but it was, it was hard work. It was hard work. Mm. A lot of pacing around, repeating it endlessly. Yeah, I can't say it. Mixing out a video, that's as far as I can go. Was there a second part? Sorry. Uh, of all the inventions on Red Dwarf, like the Luck Virus and Tempest, which were your favourites and would you have them in real life if you could? I loved the Luck Virus idea. I thought that was brilliant. I often think of that. Because you, you do, you just try to, if people that are lucky, you do try to hang around with them so, they, <laughs> so it rubs off. And um, I think we kind of do that. I love the matter panel. Just because it was a matter paddle. <laughs> Sir, it's a matter paddle. <laughs> I, I always preferred the Holly Hop Drive. <laughs> um, because it was just so crap. <laughs> Complex box with Holly yeah. Drive on it. Yeah. No, I'm joking, the sexual magnetism uh, nice. virus. Yeah. Yeah. That was yep. I've never needed it, but <laughs> he lied. Like he totally did nothing happened. He's singing with um, Danny and doing tongue tied. How about an album for us? <laughs> Any chance? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's for me, isn't it, really? Yeah, that was just flibbity flibbity. How did it go? Biddly bop, biddly bop. No, uh, do you know, I mean, obviously it was a Danny solo mainly. Yeah. Um, uh, do you know, singing did not even enter my head. I was too busy counting out the steps that were never really shot in the end. 
Uh, you know, we spent the whole week rehearsing that one song, and Ed By, the director, was getting rather annoyed um, with us because we were spending all the time on that sort of, what, two and a half minutes or whatever it was of the song. And we didn't have, you know, any time to do the other sort of 25 and a half minutes of the show. Um, and no, it was just uh, Craig and I were, um, I just think we would both admit that we're probably not, you know, got the gift of dancing. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I can't remember anything about that. So I thought someone was going to sort of play it. Someone sort of got it on, uh, you know. Probably a few people's um, ringtone, I bet. Yeah, it was. Uh, going back to an earlier question, that would not be on the list of things that I remember most about Red Dwarf. In fact, I ironed it out of my memory until you brought it up. <laughs> but uh, no, yes, it was. Uh, yeah, that was it got in the charts, didn't it? It did get, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then they re recorded it and it didn't get in the charts. Yeah, yeah. got to 19. Got to 19. Wow, it was released as a 12 inch single. Who's that? Yeah. yeah. None of us got that, I guess. No, I haven't. No. They haven't given us a copy. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've got a question for Chris. Um, how was the character of Ace Rumor developed? Uh, it seemed like a, a character you really relished playing. Well, someone asked, you know, earlier on, right at the beginning, you know, if, if there's anything about a character that's like, like me. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with this. Um, it, it, it's, Ace is just, you know, put a little bit of bass on the old voice, and, uh, you know, you're there. Oh, that's me. No, it's not. It, it's a bit of a, it, 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 We're talking sort of an ability, an opportunity for Rimmer to become James Bond, really. And that was kind of what was at the back of my mind. Um, when I was doing it and, and voice-wise to sort of differentiate and try and make a sort of, sort of cooler vocal treatment to, 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 to Rimmer, really. Um, but yeah, it, 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 was a, it was a chance to be, you know, James Bond, really, uh, in, in a Red Dwarf context. Uh, what was, there any, um, what, was there ever any time that you looked at a script and saw something in it and thought, good God, no? <laughs> Actually, I think that is a, a, a testament to, to initially Robin Douglas and, and more recently just Doug's skill is, is no, is I think the simple answer that they are. And it's quite possible there have been scripts that we never saw that would have, we would have said that to, but, but they were rejected. So uh, I don't ever remember reading one and going, no, this isn't going to work. This is, or this is outside the Red Dwarf universe, or this breaks the kind of golden rules of Red Dwarf. I, I, I certainly never... I don't remember reading one and going, I mean, I've read a lot and going, I don't know how on earth we're going to be able to do this, but it's a brilliant idea and I love it. You know, that's quite a common experience, but not. Ditto what Bobby just said, really. I mean, good God, no, I don't want to do this. Um, it's every script I've ever read, right? Yeah. <laughs> there was a few things, you know, I mean, there's a few sort of cosy changes and stuff and, 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 and you know, situations where you are going to have a, a VW wind machine sort of blowing water into your mouth or something like that. Yeah, I mean, but there's no, no point was the, I mean, speeches, you know, like the one, whatever it is, dodecahedron, da 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 a um, few space core directives, you know, I've gone, good God, no, you know, sort of episode six, we've been working quite hard for a few months, yeah. and suddenly, you know, you see a speech, a mother of speeches, and you think, good God, no. But um, ultimately, you're thinking whether it's looking impossible to do, if it serves the show and it's funny and it works, then y you find a way of doing it. Harry, right, question, please, Lee. Um, two questions, please. One for Hattie and one for Robert. Um, when Holly had to bang her head on the screen to count, did you actually have to do that? Uh, but it was like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it wasn't, it wasn't originally in the script. It's just uh, the cat said, we've got to extend her IQ because she can only count to three by banging her head on the screen. And I kind of said, oh, I've never done that, actually. So, so then they did it. So uh, I did it just before he said it, otherwise it wouldn't have made any sense. <laughs> so yeah, that's all I had to do was go like that, but like that really. <laughs> I just think I anything black to put in front of me just to get the full effect. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> and this, is, this is my real hair, there's no stunned wig or anything, so yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's what I had to do. No. 
and, and, um, no, and no hitting real any real screen. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Robert, are you still in contact with your other heads? Oh, I just see here. I just saw a picture of the spare heads one, two, and three. And they, they do occasionally get in touch. What are you doing, you half humanoid with all your nasty habits? No, I'd love to do. I did love spare heads one, two, and three, particularly spare head three with galloping droid rot. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, that came actually. I think that that, that was one. Of, I don't know where. The, uh, I can't now remember exactly what it was, but there was occasions. You know, you'd sit in front of because you were in front of the mirror for hours getting the makeup done. And I found if I sort of went like that, you know, crying just became like, you know, he was from Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> and he lived in a canal for 50 years and no one cared. <laughs> I don't know where it came from, and, uh, but it made Doug laugh, and I think they worked it into the thing. I don't quite remember how it all came about, but it was. Well, it was Manchester, wasn't it? Really? Yeah, we were recording in Manchester then, yeah, on <laughs> uh, Oxford Road. Uh, we have a question at the back. Okay, uh, most of you have had careers since Red Dwarf, but is there anything from Red Dwarf that you've never been allowed to live down? Uh, <laughs> never been allowed to, to live down. Um, <laughs> These are extraordinary questions, They're brilliant questions, yeah. I think um, Manchester people are really clever, I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, not being able to, to live down um, my dancing in Tongue Tied. <laughs> <laughs> um, my acting, generally. <laughs> <laughs> my um, asking Gandhi to give me... Give me 50 press-ups, yeah. Press that was the yeah. second Gandhi, do you remember? The, the first one was, was too ancient to get out of the car. Yeah. <laughs> he was using a publicity photo that was about 30 years old. <laughs> Yeah, talking of meltdown, I, I know this is getting away from your, your question, but um, others will return to it. But, uh, just uh, meltdown, to the, I always think of meltdown now as being actually quite an, uh, such an interesting episode. Because obviously I, I'm a huge Elvis fan, and to have Elvis on the set was, was, was amazing. So going back to an earlier question, one of your high moments of the show, it was in one of, an early Red Dwarf convention in, uh, in Liverpool, where we sang The Wonder of You, with Elvis sort of guiding us through it, you know? Take it away, fellas. Take it away, Chris. Oh, you sing, baby. You sing, baby. I'm not going to sing, man. You sing. You know? And he allowed us to sing it. No, that, that was a great moment, you know? Sorry. So, but yeah, your question was... Um, I forgot that. What was that? Oh, living things down. Living things down, oh, yeah. Well, I've answered that tongue-tied. Oh, yes. Um, I think just actually being Camille in the <laughs> 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 Being in an episode of Red Dwarf. Traumatising your son. Yes, that's true, yeah. Because my son saw it. Did we just tell that story? Not on stage. You can do it now, though. Yeah, because <laughs> he saw it when I was when he was about three years old, and of course I turned into a green blob in the episode, and he was watching it with his granny, and he was inconsolable because he thought I'd really turned into a green blob. <laughs> I know. Bless. He's almost 21 now. <laughs> He did remind us recently that he was permanently scarred by that experience. But, uh, <laughs> seems all right. I think you're having an IQ of six, probably. <laughs> 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 I think, uh, well, I went on Celebrity Mastermind and they probably thought, oh, she didn't be any good on that. It was all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, my IQ, I think, probably. And my hair. My voice. <laughs> I looked like this when I went to the audition. I just like walked in like this. So, yeah. so I, I was Holly before, in a sense, <laughs> with my IQ and my hair. Voice. <laughs> right, I have a question from an agent of Nerve who's just kind of halfway across. He's going to pass that to. This is probably mainly for Chris and maybe Robert. Is there anything from the Red Dwarf books that you'd wish was included in the show? Oh, wow. Because you did the audio books and everything. Seem to remember. Well, it's a long time since I read yeah. them. I, mean, you, uh, 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 I remember a lovely book. I remember there was one thing. I was on the beach uh, in the south of France actually um, reading one of the books. And um, it was said something about Rimmer was looking at the back of his head in a mirror and wondering about an expanding ball patch or something like that. And I was thinking, God, 
<laughs> did they put that? Have they put that in the show yet? You know. Um, so apart from that, I can't think of anything else really. But that's vanity, isn't it? Really, that's how long it sort of stays with you. But no, the books. I think they put a lot of the stuff from the books, uh, you know, from that book yeah. into the show anyway. Um, but yeah, some of the personal observations of Rimmer that, of course, mirrored, you know, because they were written after you know we'd been cast, you know, were uh, were, were laid bare. And of course, you know. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, you, in a book you can have all these little different layers, but you can't necessarily, they're all unsaid in the, um, in the TV show. Um, so, yeah, no, apart from that, the same thing springs out when you mention that. We have a question, Mr. Chairman, here. The question for all of you. I was wondering, if you were to cameo in the show, how would you like to do it? Cameo in the show? Well, if we, uh, yes, I see what you mean. Uh, uh, I'd like to get back in as a I'd like, yes, I'd like to play a limp-wristed vicar ace river. That <laughs> 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 had the hair and the, and the glasses and the jacket, but was really useless. And constantly apologising and getting everything wrong. That would be perfect for me. Well, of course, I, I, I would like to play an entire episode as Rimmer. I'm back in the voice of Kenneth Williams. <laughs> Lister, Lister, how disgusting you are. Can I come here? The roar, you're the only thing I about. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that'll be my cameo. Yeah. My cameo was Hilly, really. I was only meant to be in that one episode. So, But I'd, um, I'd like to go in it with something, with a costume. Somebody with a costume, I think, would be nice. Legs. Yeah, legs. <laughs> I, I wouldn't care if they were shown or not. Just the costume, or... Mm. Yeah, I'd like to... Uh, Dolly Parton, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's Dolly Parton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and duet with Elvis. Well, let, yes. Let Doug know. Yeah, the musical. Red Wolf, the musical version. Mm. Elvis, Dolly Parton. It's cold outside. <laughs> but no kind of atmosphere singing, baby. Thank you very much. You did that. At the end of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That marvellous. And in that episode, you had uh, surreal situations where we weren't recording anything, just rehearsing of, of Elvis and Marilyn Monroe sitting talking to each other, <laughs> just chatting. <laughs> and you know, they were they were talking like as, as as the real people, but he was wearing Elvis downtime stuff, the black shirt and the shades. You know, how are you, baby? <laughs> you know, and she was just like, "Oh, hi, Elvis, how are you?" This kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, it was quite surreal, the whole thing. You know. <coughs> now we have one more question, which is on your far right over here. This person. Hi, if you guys hadn't been Red Dwarf, who would you cast to play your characters? We used to talk about it when, you know, if, if uh, Rob and Doug ever managed to get, make it into a Hollywood movie, who, who would play all the characters. And I mean, we did have a list, because certainly Tom Hanks to play Crichton, I remember that. that was, mm. uh, he looks like Rob, doesn't he? He does, he, didn't, he wouldn't even make it. <laughs> <laughs> can't remember the others. Um. There was talk of whether well, Alan Rickman actually was approached mm. originally to play Rimmer, wasn't he, uh, uh, very early on? Or there was discussions with that? I think Roger Moore to play uh, <laughs> Rimmer. Uh, this time, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't really work, really. <laughs> I don't know who could. Who could uh... It was Eddie, uh, uh, Danny was always going about Eddie Murphy playing. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember what it was. I can't remember who's going to play. But those are serious. Um, yes, they would be. do the part well. I'm yeah. trying to think of someone who oh, would be, be, be for the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so Daniel Craig is Rimmer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know who would make a good uh, good list. Ray Winston. <laughs> <laughs> I think he probably could do a job as Lister, couldn't he? Um, yeah, there's uh, I don't know, Craig. Hugh Grant. Hugh Grant. Sort of posh, terribly posh, but apologetic. He, he wouldn't need to act, just no, be himself. No, no. <laughs> Perfect. It, when they did the American pilot, Jane leaves Daphne from Frasier was Holly. So. <laughs> <laughs> but no, her career, no.
nose diagnosis, he did that. He only did, what, eight, 18 series of Frasier. <laughs> Two and a half million dollars an episode. Poor girl, she's really scraping a living now. <laughs> <laughs> did, did she do Red Dwarf after that? No, before that. Before she? that, yeah. Oh. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time we have for our Red Dwarf panel. Please give them a massive round.